I uh, am director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the CUNY Graduate Center. And uh, we are co-sponsoring this visit by Marion Kramer uh, with uh, the Brecht uh, Forum. So I want to wel welcome you on behalf of both the Center and the Brecht Forum to this event. It's a great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Marion Kramer. She's been very active in politics uh, in Detroit in particular over the last 50 years. Is that an underestimate or no. what? You're great. <laughs> yeah, I'm great. And uh, um, been very actively involved uh, in, in po politics in the city which as uh, you all know has undergone major transformations and is still undergoing major transformations and, and I think it's interesting to reflect on the nature of the struggles as they existed in the 1960s in relationship to the nature of the struggles as they've unfolded uh, over time to the present set of uh, struggles with Detroit about to be taken over by a state appointed manager and all of the struggles that are uh, articulated uh, around that. Uh, Marion has uh, been involved in many organizations She's founder and president of the National Welfare Rights uh, Union. In 1989, she helped to form the National Up and Out of Poverty Now Coalition and now serves as its co-president. She has organized lower income and welfare recipients to challenge public assistance policies and was an outspoken crusader against the 1996 Welfare uh, Rights Bill. Um, Kramer was one of the founders of an early workers' rights organization called the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. She also served as a full-time organizer for the Congress of Racial Equality uh, in Louisiana during the 1960s. Uh, and you can kind of lose count of the number of organizations that she has participated in over, over uh, decades. So I thought the format here appropriate would be to ask uh, Marian to reflect a little bit on uh, that long history, some of the lessons that might be learned for activism today, uh, and then bring us up to date a little bit about contemporary struggles in Detroit, uh, those that she's particularly in, involved with. So without more ado, I'll turn it over to you. So welcome uh, here again, and uh, we hope you'll become a permanent member of uh, our organizations here in New York City. <laughs> well, I used to be here. I, had, I was, I, I'm, let me say, I'm so happy to be back. Uh, I used to live here in New York, in Brooklyn, and in three different communities, because I had to come up here in the 70s for welfare rights to organize. And uh, New York can either break you, or, I tell you, it almost broke me at one point but I ended up with the strength to bounce back. Um, as Dave said, uh, I started out in the civil rights movement because my objective situation at that particular time was that I was, I was raised, I was born in the South. I was born in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a section of that uh, Louisiana, which, uh, Baton Rouge, which is the West Baton Rouge, which is Port Allen, Louisiana. And uh, my family, like all the families there, faced the conditions that, you know, brought on the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, my grandfather was forced to move. We had to get him out of town when I, I think I was about four years old, about five or four years old at the time, when he was working across the street from my house on that chapel Street, right close to the levee in, in Port Allen. Uh, and he was working in a, a, a bar and his little boss was young enough to be his grandson, but his boss treated him like private property. And daddy loved baseball at that time. And he told that young man and warned that young man, you mess with me and disrespect me again, and three times you are out. That young man, you know, figured given the conditions in the South, he had the right to treat my grandfather anyway, any kind of way that he felt was necessary. And he did. He slapped my grandfather. 
And my grandfather at that time had a little pen knife and my grandfather cut him. Well, you know, he cut him that bad. But my grandfather was, uh, was uh, black. So therefore, uh, we knew, my parents did, that, that the uh, authorities were being mobilized to come and get my grandfather. They, and they probably was going to hang him or whatever. But the family came together quick enough that they decided to get my grandfather out of there and he went to Dallas, Texas because he was from a huge family also, 15 children, you know, and he had a sister in, in, in Dallas, Texas and he, he was snuck out, of, they snuck him out of there and got he had Highway 80 at that time. Some of you remember that uh, Highway 80 from, uh, from the south all the way to taking you to California and some of the old movies and stuff. To Highway 80 and then took him to Dallas, Texas. And a year and a half after that, we relocated to Dallas. My mother, who had just separated from my father, it was uh, three boys, one female, me, and uh, my grandmother uh, and my grandfather, and all of us were in the same car at the time. Uh, traveling that lonely highway with a roll of toilet paper, because we could not use none of the bath, uh, none of the restrooms in the, in the uh, service stations at the time. And a truck we were following that uh, had all our belongings in it. But that, that laid the foundation for me. I remembered all that. And it laid the foundation for me to uh, cultivate me in years to come because I ended up joining a church. Our family was in a church that ended up being in the Civil Rights Movement. Golden Gate Baptist Church where we stepped forward before any church to support my old teacher who took a stand in, uh, in Dallas because they, she was told that, well all of them were told that no black teacher could move into Skyline Heights, which was a division in Dallas. She and her husband, who was a salesman for women girls at the time, some of y'all remember those uh, at the time, door to door. They took a stand and bought a house in Skyline Heights. This was very uh, impressive. And, you know, it really impressed me because this was my art teacher of all people that took this stand. And the whole of Dallas became and looked like involved in that fight. And uh, I, uh, so I, that type of stuff stayed with me. My mother got us involved in the civil rights movement. And eventually they told me, you know how parents are. They might have you involved when you're a kid and then you go off to college. And the first thing they tell you, don't get involved in some of that activity that's going on. Well, in Louisiana, the students at Southern University had began to join the civil rights movement. And they were demanding that they have the same benefits, the same type of programs that LSU. Louisiana State University was enjoined from the state. This school, if you go to Louisiana, to Baton Rouge, you will see that this school is located in mainly a black community. But we could only go to the gates in this black community. And if you go past the gate, it's because you were working on that campus. So, uh, you know, all that was, ha a lot of that was happening at the time. And I was told by my parents, I went back to Louisiana to attend Southern University to stay with my father, and he told me also, don't get involved in the activities at Southern University. Well, the activities, uh, when the core Congress of Racial Equality came there, they were meeting at my aunt's cafe, which was right on the other side of the city limit. And quite naturally, I was interested in what they were talking about, and I got involved, just like my cousins who were kicked out of school for participating. They could not attend no schools in the state of Louisiana for participating at that time. I got involved, and that did it. It sparked me. I went out on a um, summer project because we, you know, we had to be trained to be staffed. Uh, task force workers and all those civil rights organizations. So they took you through an intense training on how to demonstrate what some of the laws were, all that. 
a whole full week or two weeks of, of training before you were released to go into those projects. But that was my big beginning into the movement. Two and a half years later, I ended up in Detroit, Michigan, because I decided to get married. And at the time, when I went to Detroit in 1964, when I returned, we, we were on our way back to Louisiana after we got married, and people had convinced us in Detroit to, to come back there because of our organizing experience in the South. And they wanted us to be a part of the Alinsky-type model that was developing throughout the country. Um, and we decided to come back, so we had to return to Louisiana, but I had to from um, Tennessee all the way to um, Louisiana. I had to drive, ride in the back of the car under a blanket because my husband being Anglo and being white and I being black, we could have got killed. And furthermore, I could not say that we were married because of the miscegenation law that existed in the country at that time. But we made it back, and we went back to De Detroit and became organizers for the community. And that started a new type of world for me because I was beginning to learn unions. I was beginning to lay know the layout of the community and some of the contradictions that were existing at that time in Detroit. The factories were beginning to open more and more for uh, blacks to become uh, workers there. Uh, more and more people were uh, beginning to organize around slum landlords and, and fighting, there, fighting against them. Uh, and people that you thought that uh, would be on your side and talk the great talk, but when it came down to reality as far as the community, being able to uh, determine their destiny, those same people, some of those people were ending up blocking you. I began to understand what the legislative process was all about as far as city council and began to understand that they really didn't have no rights. And all they were supposed to do was legislate. But in the final analysis, uh, the administration ended up doing whatever they wanted to at the time. So look here, this was back in the 19. 60s, uh, and we began to fight for housing because they were urban renewal, new concept at that time, urban renewal. And, and they were beginning to go in these communities that were working class communities for Wayne State, had, because Wayne State had said they wanted, they wanted this area, University City number one, two, three, and four, and a research area that the city had rezoned that whole area for the benefit of Wayne State and uh, offered the people a, a price for their houses at that time. I was sent in to organize them. My husband, all of us, were sent in to organize them. And the main thing that people told us was, look, they can't take our houses. We own our houses. We have worked in these factories and we have paid for our houses. We've been here for years. We want our houses to be here for our children. We say, well, we done learned a bit too, just like you. Once they take you through condemnation court and offer you the market price, you own the house, but you don't own the property that the house sits on. They will tell you, you could take the house and move it, but, uh, uh, but you will not be able to own that property. That was a rude awakening again for me at that time around the question of housing uh, that they could rezone an area take property from people uh, who have lived and sweat at their tears and want to retire in the area and not able to stay there because they wanted to rezone it for no other than Wayne State then I found out where I was living in the area that uh, a tree was going to replace where I was living because they wanted an uh, area that the students could come through, sit up under trees, and read books. And so I said, well, I'll be darned. I've been replaced by many things, but not a tree. But 
At that particular time, Detroit was, be, uh, was at its height in a, a lot of organizing. We had the religious community out with us at WCO. We had some of the unions, such as the Teamsters, whoever was located in that area out there fighting, uh, fighting with us. We had students. We had the community, which was the key and the base that uh, all the block clubs that said they were not going to let them come in there and just urban renewal them out. So they decided one day that they were going to save Holbrook Street. Now there's a little history of a save Holbrook Street, which was the only street left in the research area for Wayne State. They decided we're going to put some stairs on these houses that they had to condemn and move people out. We moved to put stairs on there, and I think I was the first one they threw in the paddy wagon. Uh, and we began to face, myself and a, uh, another lady and uh, several ministers, seven years in the federal penitentiary for trying to move a family, put some stairs on a house, to keep it for the community and move a family into this house. We had to go back and forth to court. We began to understand the need to organize and, and fight your battle in the street even before you go to court. So we would pack the courtrooms and what have you, uh, you know, and constantly educate the community as to what was going on. And we won our case eventually. And, and uh, it was thrown out. But it was, it was that type of battle that was going on. We, would, we were fighting slum landlords. A young, uh, some young kids were killed in a big um, house, a slum building. And who was only in the house but one of, uh, one of the big known black people in Detroit who had an upstairs maid or downstairs or something to go pick at this man and run into the, his butler and all that type of stuff was shocking to us. But we were able to take him on and make him pay for the death of these children uh, in this slum building and what have you. It was, it was, when you ask what was happening at that time, the conditions were bad. And what, at, and it ushered on at that time, the need on the back of that, the need for organizations to begin to develop like welfare rights organization. Uh, our, the National Welfare Rights came about and it, after a Poor People's Conference in Syracuse, New York in 1964, I think, I can't remember those. And we, we began to form the National Welfare Rights Organization. Over 100,000 people became a member. You had organizations here in New York. One of the biggest organizations was in uh, about three or four of these boroughs coming together in, here in, uh, in New York. Uh, organization like the uh, first, the drum movement, where workers began to come together and they would meet on, mon on Sundays in, in our office and, and talk about the conditions that they were facing in the factories. And we decided to teach them how to put a leaflet together. And in that leaflet, they would be talking about the condition because this factory, Dodge Main had, I don't know, several floors. It was like a city. You had several baseball teams in there and everything in this factory. But they put that leaflet together to talk about the condition in the factory and be able to organize those workers there. So we would use like an eight and a half by 11 or eight and a half by 14 sheet of paper. We were learning how to run those mimeograph machines, Get Stepner had come out at the time. And the Get Stepner workers had told us as we would go down there, and I know that a lot of the young people don't know about those Get Stepner machine. That was the best uh, machine you could get for printing after a while, because they had those uh, stencil burners too, also. You could put a sheet of paper on one side that had a drawing and it burnt the stencil on this side, or you thought you were in another world having that type of equipment. And what happened was we started with the drum and we began to, the workers began to take that drum uh, paper into the factory and it began to organize that factory. Even if the worker that helped put those, what we began to learn was collectivity because if you had a one factory and people sit down on a Sunday and put that newspaper together, if you were only uh, said something that 
uh, in an article, uh, but it was your wording or something like that. You felt as a part of something, because you, you, know, you become a part of a collective in there, a caucus within that factory. So Dodge Revolutionary Union, Union began. We would be out there at four and five o'clock in the morning. There was three shifts. And you get lost in those shifts, passing out those newsletters. It'd be dark in the morning. We would use, after a while, the students start coming to us and say, we got problems at the schools. And we sit them down and teach them how to put a newsletter together. And they would get up early in the morning and became forces and helping to, once the workers did their leaflets, they would take the responsibility to take those uh, leaflets out to the factories. We would go with them and put those out uh, to be able to help the workers with their leaflets getting out. Then some of the uh, medical workers came to us about, you know, they were liking what was going on. And the forces began to expand, some of the nurses, and all until we had practically every school, high school, in the city of Detroit that had black students at it. Some of the, there were a couple of uh, middle schools that were a part of it, and then we found out it was some elementary schools that were, there. but the students ran that organization themselves. After that, we looked around, and then other factories become, began to come in. And so we ended up after several years, the, although the League, uh, the, we began to, it was the women component part in the League, began to struggle for an organization of all these component parts. Because we were the ones in the final analysis that was there doing a lot of that work. We said, look, we got to bring these organizations together. Now, we were at the same time fighting back a lot of uh, male supremacists, too. Because you know how these males think they are the, the, uh, the smartest and the strongest thing in the organization. But when you go cut down to the core of the thing, you'll see who's in the background a lot of time doing a lot of that work. And it was, uh, it was us women. Uh, we all had children. We had husbands. We had all that. All of us were involved in getting those newsletters out to talk to those uh, workers and what have you. The first strike, wildcat strike that we had was with drum. We wanted the workers to test their strength. So we told everybody to meet us. Uh, now see, when you go into those factories, they usually had a little strip across the street from them that you can, uh, by the time you left, going home and you got your check on Friday, you probably didn't have nothing by the time you got home because you could either, you can go in and gamble, you can get something to eat, you can go into the motel, everything, all across the street. And plus, there were so many workers that they had to rent the truck coming up to cash your check. So a lot of the women started meeting their husbands when they came out to make sure that they cashed the check where they could have some money at home. So we went out there that morning and said, we're not working today. They had become familiar with us. They knew who we were. They said, well, we said, we're not working today, so I advise you not to go in. And they started saying, that's fine with me. Because they had been killing those workers. Those workers was working seven days a week. I mean, <coughs> 12 hours a day. Uh, they said, it's fine with me. And, and some of the white workers said, hey, if they ask me, I'm staying out too. And we did that for about two or three days. We looked up and the, in Hamtramck, Hamtramck is a, a mainly Polish in, in Detroit. It's a city right in the middle of Detroit. There are two cities located in the middle of Detroit, Hamtramck and Holland Park, right in the center. And once we got all the workers out, we looked up two days in a row. The war, uh, they had all these police forces coming out from Detroit, from Hamtramck, and what have you. And they had axe hammers to try to beat us down if we, sh if we should charge as they came up. Well, the second day, I got kind of mad. And I told General Baker, my husband, at the time, uh, I told him, I said, look, I'm not moving. I am sick of this. 
He said, well, you're going to have to move. Because if they hit you, then these workers are going to charge. And then we don't need that right now. So the next thing I knew, I was being picked up just like a little kid uh, and taken off because it wasn't time for us to confront the police like that. But during that period of time, the workers eventually began to see their strength. Um, UAW began to see the strength of the workers, that the workers began to understand their strength. We not only hit Dodge, Maine, we hit Eldon, Gary, and Axel wanted that to happen to them. This was the area that had five plants in this particular area for Chrysler. Ford Motor Company, which is at that time at its peak during World War II, they were working over 100,000 people. And when we went out there to organize, they were up to 30,000. So that little newspaper became the tool to mobilize and organize these workers at the time. Every demand that we had in each one of those plants began to be taken care of as far as letting workers, uh, that black workers should become a part of the uh, leadership in those factories, the conditions of those factories, and uh, as far as health and safety, start being taken care of. Uh, people began to emerge out of there, some of our members, as some of the uh, shop stewards, uh, some of the representative, you know, as far as in the union and stuff. Although we had to battle the UA within the UAW, and we had to battle uh, the factory, we didn't give up. Now in the end, almost, they decided to start attacking individuals. They decided to come after my husband, and, tell him, and so he had to go, as they said at that time, underground. And they started serving us out there and what have you, uh, for, because they, didn't, they said that we shouldn't have been having no uh, wildcat strikes. Well, I think is, if you break the contract, be it you or the union, you, you know, it, particularly the, fact, uh, the uh, company, that we have the right to walk out. And those contracts were being broken. But they said that we were on a wildcat strike. But at that time, let me tell you how, how tense it was in Detroit as far as these workers organizing. You don't know what you're doing when you first walk out. People say, now, why haven't the workers stood up and, and, and fought back like they probably did historically and stuff? My, my experience with the working class as far as uh, in, in Detroit is that the workers will fight back. But it takes the United States working class a long time to understand something. And once they begin to understand it, they will move. And I've seen them move. And I, and I noticed, too, when people would come to Detroit, like um, Jesse Jackson, he couldn't speak unless he come over there and talk to uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. You know, it got to that point. And, you know, we were a type of organization, just want to hug and everybody, but everybody wasn't for us. You know, but we, we got all, when you get all your demands met, you got to learn how to shift that organization. At the same time that we had organized drum, even at, at WCO, it began to write, you know, uh, you know, we had organized the whole community and got all the demands met and stopped Wayne State from urban renewing people out and what have you. And then that organization ceased to, ex uh, to exist. And sooner or later, Wayne State has been waiting in the cost and waited till the community deteriorated and they have moved over there to take the community anyway, you know. But what has happened since that time? Drum grew at a time when there were certain reforms that needed to be taken care of. Uh, all those reforms have been taken care of, and people say, why can't we build a drum today? Because, and people have tried. We say that this is not the same conditions that gave rise to drum at the time. 
the name of the game today, you go in some of the Dutch main do not exist no more. We can go through and through of all those factories that used to exist that are closed. Because the name of the game today is technology. You have factories that have worked like, like out of Ford Motor Company, where it had 14 plants in this complex. They have, they have technology out there now. And if a factory might have worked uh, uh, 6,000 people, they might be down, uh, I think Ford is down to 14 or 15, uh, 14,000 workers out in those uh, particular plants now. They don't have three shifts no more because technology is running those factories. Um, and a lot of those workers are unemployed. Right now, what is the fight in Detroit? It's to not let that emergency manager take place. Because they don't need, a, you know, at one time, we could quit a factory today and get another job in the evening time. My husband must have uh, went to three factories in one day. And, and, and once they found out who he was, they, they fired him. And uh, he, ended up, he had to change his name. That was, I'm telling you, he had this all organized. We had, we had uh, some of the doctors organized, psychiatrists and stuff. If we wanted to send the workers away for an education and something, we'd call the psychiatrists and say, get that, get that package ready and have them out of the factory for three months while they're going to get an education, you know, to help the movement and that type of stuff. All that is closed now. All of it is closed. Michigan, I mean, Detroit was known for having houses for the workers. If you see Detroit now and compare it to some of the pictures when it used to exist and look at the community, you think it's a bombed out city. What happens is a lot of the houses that uh, we used to take, even when we build, helped build the homeless union and was taking over houses and moving people in there in the 90s and what have you, a lot of those communities might have one house on the block or no houses at all. It's plenty of land in Detroit. It's more land. It's so much land in Detroit, you could probably take Boston and put it there. But uh, what is happening? What is happening in Detroit is, is coming to a lot of other communities. I lived in Harlem Park, and I lived up under an emergency manager. And you want to see the beginning of fascism, you will see it living under this. And what is the emergency? And see, there was Public Act 72 that was passed uh, in the, I think about around the uh, early 90s or something like that. And that calls for an emergency financial manager. And under, in Harlem Park, which was the city of trees, which was the city that um, Henry Ford built his first car in, was one of the places they brought the emergency financial manager at one time, the early, six, uh, early 20s, uh, about 2001 or something like that. I'm trying to think back. Uh, and they brought in a woman with locks. And she was the same color we were. And if you ever see this movie, uh, The Waterfront, it kind of tells you something about that. Her name was Rem is Ramona Pearson. And her responsibility was, was to take over Harlem Park, run Harlem Park. See, the council didn't have no power. The mayor didn't have no power, none of those uh, departments that had been set up, commissioners, none of them, no power. The police department didn't have no power. She was the dictator. She had the right to hire a city manager. And she hired a person to come in there to take over the water department. And these were people that she hired that worked on the collaborative that she's a part of. She's a, she's a numbers person. And she, they paid her $150,000 to work part time. She turned around and paid the woman that she brought in 
to be the city manager, $250,000. More than what the mayor has ever made in Holland Park. The mayor didn't make no more than $60,000 in this was More than a city council at one time, you know, they were making, at that time, $10,000, because they were part-time. You know, more than the mayor of Detroit and more than the governor, this a, a city manager was making. And then they brought in the water person who had helped privatize the water in Georgia. He flew in once a week for two days a week. They, and we had to pay for it. And he was paid, and he worked only two days a week. He was paid 90000 a year. Good money. And they always told us in Holland Park, you don't have no money. Well, I was saying, you, the, the finan emergency financial manager, the city manager, uh, and all these contracts you have out and what have you, uh, the state is taking, but the state was not. They were taking care of her salary, which was still coming out of Harlem Park at the time. And then we found out she had sold off all, any property that Harlem Park bought. She, she laid off all the people at the water plant, because Harlem Park owns its own water. Henry Ford made sure when he was building his factory, he built the infrastructure for that factory. So he was drawing water uh, out of, out of uh, St. Clair and all that type, and straight to Highland Park. So we didn't have to purchase water from Highland, from Detroit. Detroit has, what, about four million customers throughout Michigan. Uh, we had our own water, but we had to purchase sewage services from Detroit. When we decided that we were through with the emergency manager, some of the residents, we came together around our water bill. And we named ourselves the Holland Park Human Rights Coalition. And people were meeting there. I said, well, okay, how, how often do we have to meet? The first meeting we called, the church was packed because people were outraged about their water bills. And I said, okay, we're going, what are we, someone had said, let's pick it every week in front of the courthouse. I said, oh, Lord, here I go again. In front of the courthouse we were, once a week, for an hour, we pick it, and we kind of polarized what was going on in Holland Park. And we began to find out that the fire department, the people that was, was uh, supporting us, as well as the police, I said, yeah, I guess so, you don't have no job no more. That was polarized. And now, if you imagine, Holland Park sits right in the middle of Detroit. There's a street that divides the east from the west is Woodward Avenue. And Highland Park is right on, uh, either on the east side of Woodward or the west side. You have to go through Highland Park to probably get to the, to get to the north end of Detroit, northeast and northwest. And so we occupy this little area, 2.4 or something miles. Highland Park used to have 50,000 people in it, and that's what the water department, that's what the water service at one time. Now we're down to about probably 10,000 people mainly people on a fixed income. Now, back in 2005, when we were doing all this fighting against the water, of, uh, against the um, emergency manager, she said she couldn't do nothing. We said, well, what, why they send you in here if you can't do nothing? She said, well, I have to deal with these numbers and get, this, get Highland Park back on the footage. We found out that she was trying to privatize the management of our water. She didn't tell us, city council didn't even know. And that they wanted to, we, the contract was set up that the citizen of Highland Park would only get 20% should there be a profit off our water and the management company would get 80%. And should there be any problems with the infrastructure, 
we would have to pay out our 80 percent. We hit the doors, and I'm telling you, it's not easy to go. So Island Park is mainly homes. It's not easy to go house to house in the dead of the winter, and when it's snowing and freezing. But we hit the we hit the doors. We hit the we hit we stayed on those picket lines. And we began to expose, put leaflets out all in Detroit and everything. And then one Saturday we decided, and let me tell you, some of these people have never been in demonstrations before in their life. We, we got on with the Sierra Club, we got on with other environmental groupings, and we began to expose uh, you know, certain facts about the water department and what was going on at the time. And it, it turned into a good movement. Uh, people start coming out on Thursday. They were even in the in the winter time, cooking hot dogs out there for for people that passed and giving them information and that type of stuff. Very creative. Once you turn the masses look, they would. They told me we got to meet every Thursday after each one of these meetings, and we've never had less than uh, 20 people in those meetings. But most of the time, those meetings would consist of 50 and up people joining that movement. So we had students from, students from U of M that showed up, and then we started mobilizing to stop this taking over of our water. She looked up, when they called the city council, said we're gonna, they were continuing to meet on their own. They called a hearing, and, and uh, this guy presented who he was, J.R. Wright uh, Company, and, and they asked him point blank, have you ever managed a water de a, the water department for anyone else? Any other city? No, but you know, this was, this is a big endeavor for, this is a big thing for us, but I think we can do it. And as all of us test, we all testified. And we took, well, we take over the city council. You know, I don't care where we are, if it's concerning our situation, and what we, are, what we are facing, we take over those city council meetings. What happened was, the five city council members, what we had planned, we had all gone through. Because of this water spike, we, we, during the election time, we participated in that. And we supported about three of the candidates out of five. And we replaced them on city council. So we did a three-prone type of thing, the courts, the legislative, and the state. We went to the state of Michigan. People had never been, some people had never been to Lansing before. And we talked to some of the legislators up there. And we told them about Ramona Pearson, and they didn't even know that this stuff was going on. And we exposed what was going on. When uh, Governor Granholm was beginning to run, we told her, you're going to have to help us in Island Park to get rid of this emergency manager, else we're not going to support you. When we went to the hearing before city council, we took over. You could not get into that room because it was packed with Island, Park, Island Parkers as well all out in the uh, corner, every, out of the hall, all downstairs in the courtroom, people were there. And the council for the first time voted four to one to not to hire this, this company to manage our water. That was a major victory for Highland Parkers because the council is always split on something for the benefit of the of administration. Ramona Pearson decided, I'm not gonna fight this this time. I'm gonna let them have it. So we won, but it laid the foundation eventually for Ramona Pearson to be snatched out of that area. And the contract with her was uh, stopped. And so it was a major victory for us. But, you know, you think the state was going to stop and take out this emergency manager. No, they brought in another one. And this time it was someone that was raised in Highland Park. His father had been a mayor, the mayor of Highland Park. And uh, 
he claimed that he was going to do it for uh, he, he was going to do it for one dollar, and we didn't believe him. So, but you know, the people. What happened was a lot of the people liked him. Say, oh, he's not going to hurt Allen Park. Well, he kind of cleaned up some of the financial stuff, and once there became a fight between him and the state as to how much they were going to pay him from the second year on. Then they brought in someone else. So as of right now, Holland Park, in essence, is still up under the state apparatus. There are 10 cities in, in Michigan that's up under uh, a financial manager. It's not an emergency financial manager no more. It's, it's the uh, emergency manager because they passed another law saying that this time, they went further under the present uh, governor, saying that this emergency manager can stop union contracts for five years, and they can decide, in essence, whether or not they're going back to look at those union contracts. They have emergency managers over schools, in Detroit last year, they fired all the teachers. All the teachers, and if you wanted to work, you had to come back under their rules and regulations. In other words, you probably don't have no benefits, or you came back at a much lower level. I don't care how long you've been working in the school. Uh, they had emergency manager they just brought into Holland Park around the schools, and they, and they moved to turn all the schools into charter schools. There is no public school in the city of Highland Parks no more. And these companies, and, and this, you know, all these companies are running, corporations that are running, or either a university are running, you know, all the corporate running these uh, um, chartered schools. Detroit, they are constantly moving to turn all those schools into chartered schools. There were 42 schools, 42 to 60 some schools closed down in Detroit last year. There are schools where, where there are schools that children are forced to go to charter schools because it's not now located in their communities. Uh, I just recently went to a hearing with one of the teachers who is one of the most excellent math teachers you would ever want. And she said, I'm going to carry this to its conclusion, Mary, and I said, I'll go, we'll go right along with you. She said, well, you got to go to the hearing with me. And she's used to doing hearings because at Welfare Rights, we have taught her how to do hearings. We went to the hearing with her, and there are three people sitting up front And they said, we're just here to hear your situation. And, and they have evaluated the, the teachers. And the teachers knew nothing about the evaluation. And if you score, if they score you at a certain level, this means that you do not, uh, that you are not able to get the job. Now, they didn't do the evaluations when they were, you know, at work. All these evaluations was done after they left school. At this point, they gave her an evaluation like one of the lowest points. Uh, and we asked them, well, what do you think about the fact that the, the principal never evaluated her when she was in school? They said, we have nothing to say. We are just here to listen. So each teacher that they're forcing these teachers, they know that they got to have a job in order to live. But these teachers got to all go through this same process that we can get back. Right now the, in, in Detroit, they're bringing in the emergency manager. We tried to tell people, city council, because I work with city council there also, tried to tell them and all the people in Detroit that we've been working with, with the, the UAW, ASME and all of them, you don't want this emergency manager to come in. 
when we tried to teach them when we had it in the Holland Park. We said that it's the emergency manager that dis decides whether or not you can have an election because it takes money to have an election. And it's up to the emergency manager to make that decision. Oh, no, 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 man. I say, okay, read the stuff. Read what it says. And this one is even worse. The emergency manager went into Benton Auburn and fired all the city council people. The emergency manager right now is going, they just, the other day, the board of commissioners for the water in Detroit decided to regionalize the water in Detroit. This is something we have fought back for years. Regionalize, I mean, Macomb County, Wayne County, which is the largest county in the state, and uh, Oakland County. And the people that sit on that regional board have been appointed by the governor, in essence. And all these people represent interests of corporations. Now you know the water that we draw from is from the Great Lakes. And Highland Park just recently was forced to start being serviced for our, even our water by, the great, uh, by Detroit because the workers they brought in they, in, October, in November said we need four days to transfer Highland Park services while we clean the reservoir. And then you can transfer it back. We didn't even, they didn't even tell us they were transferring our water. Who transferred our water? The little manager they had there in Detroit, in Highland Park. He didn't go to the mayor, he didn't go to Highland, to the city council, who is over the water. I get home, people calling saying, check your water. My water was brown, yellow. And then and we call around and we find out from the city council president, I just found out they transferred our water and didn't even get on with us. And then they say, well, what is, what, we don't even have a contract with Detroit. Well, I got the news this morning. Nearing the contract said, I mean, what they, uh, Detroit is charging us is $145,000. I said, what? $145,000, this little man and all the rest of them never did even try to get, that's me, don't worry about it, a contract with the city of Detroit for us to have war. They have not even, you know, it's so bad, that they have not even billed us in 13 months for our water, and we've been going up and saying, where's our bill? Why are you not billing us? because the state is trying to set us up for, see, March is the time, March 1st is the date that says in all the charters that you have had to have your, you know, dealt with your taxes, your property taxes. If that's not dealt with, then they can put your water bill onto your tax law, which sets you up for your houses being taken. So Holland, that uh, we received a bill just recently. My bill was thirteen hundred dollars. Some people bill was three thousand, four thousand. Now remember, I told you long in the beginning, and then I'm up through. I told you that Holland Park is what a fixed income mainly uh, neighborhood. Well, Detroit right now has been set up because the board of commission voted to. Uh, regionalize the water uh, and we're getting water from there we're the only two cities in the state of Michigan that's, that owns its own water now if they do that to Holland I mean to Detroit that means Holland Park also will be regionalized that means that we become the key to what they really want and that's the Great Lakes for the corporation. And what we heard was the buyer, there's a buyer in the background that wants to privatize the water. And what do you think that buyer is from? New York. New York. Some of the, um, and so, you know, we're, I, we're threatened there with our water. They're talking about going up on Detroit water again in June. 
They, we pay the highest water bill in the nation in Holland Park. We pay some of the highest taxes in the nation. But if they, if they can, and now they want to bring down rapid transit down Woodward Avenue all the way to Pontiac, they're going to start from Detroit, uh, downtown Detroit to the middle of Detroit and eventually try to expand. Now, I, think, I guess we're blocking that also. Not by you. Now, a lot of the people in Detroit are not working, not because they don't want to work, because they don't have no jobs. People are having two and three jobs to try to make do these days. And they're not even equivalent to what they used to have. The worker that's working right beside you in the factory is a two-tier situation. They, they were, they're making like $14 an hour. And there's another worker who's about, uh, you know, close to my age, probably making uh, uh, $28 an hour. You know, with benefits. But you don't have no benefits because all that was negotiated away. And on top of that, they then slapped us with the, being a right to work state. It used to be you could, like I said, you could retire from those factories, you could retire from education in places and have a good pension. That's got to be my grandchild. A good pension as well as have, you know, look forward to having social security. Social security is under attack also. So my, if you know, and I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I want to open this up. I don't know if y'all heard in the news about Paul Ryan's latest gadget that he's bringing before Congress, which is another attack on the safety net. And people never understand, people always sit back and want to always attack that section of the working class that I represent, and that's people on public assistance and low-income workers. But I'm telling you, and we said it under the Clinton administration, and I know we fought diligently against his welfare reform. You let Clinton's welfare reform get in, it was going to be the end of the safety net, which was going to be a spiring effect on Social Security and everything else. And Paul Ryan is sitting there, i got to go study it. I haven't had a chance to look. It's a real big attack on Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, all that type of stuff. You know, so if you become a senior, if you have the opportunity to become a senior in, 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 the, uh, in, uh, in the next few years, you're going to be fighting like hell to even have some insurance. And now, one thing they're about to institute also in a lot of the states, if you have been if they've tested for some kind of drugs, and it's been on the books that was passed and, and on the federal level, uh, you will not be eligible for no uh, public assistance. We've been fighting it on the state level. Right in Michigan right now, not only did this governor get into play, we, this is it. We participated in a hell of a uh, mobilization to get rid of Public Act 4 throughout the state of Michigan. There are 83 counties. Only seven counties voted to keep Public Act 4. And within the ones that went along uh, with the petition drive and, and voted to repeal Public Act 4, there were some Republican counties. Because they, they said, this man is wrong. They went right behind our back and had, the, had another uh, public act, uh, you know, instituted. We got them in the courts right now. We got them, we're still in the streets and all that stuff. But we fighting like tooth and nail in Detroit throughout the state to try to stop and fight this back. But let me tell you, if they can get Michigan, which is a, was a heavy concentration of unions and organizations and what have you, they figured that they can break the rest of the nation. And I, you know, I, I tell, the, tell young folks like yourself in particular, I hate that this is on your shoulders right now. Because all the stuff that we fought over the years to be able to be in place that you could have a decent living for yourself and your children, they are taking it away. If you are not needed to work, 
And they are, and let me tell you, even if you have a um, a good uh, job right now, they're trying to get it to be uh, have technology to replace you. But you got to have a vision. If they got technology out there, can do all the stuff that uh, that you that you can imagine, then technology should be serving the whole of humanity and not a few darn capitalists owning this stuff at our expense. They are out here, once they're not needed, they're out here to kill you. They, they don't care where you drop dead. They don't care who your mama, your daddy, your papa, nobody is. If you are not willing, if you are not needed to produce for this damn class, the hell with you. That's what they say. And they will kill your child just as quick as the batting of eye. We have children and mothers walking miles to get their kids to school. If your child is out of school, 21, if your children are out of school for so many days in Michigan now, the whole family is cut off the public assistance. They do not send a truancy officer or nobody out to check to see if you're hungry or something like that as to why the child is not attending school. The first thing they do is cut you off, the family off, and then report, uh, get a report in to protect the services only. Don't tell me that ain't fascism. Don't tell me about the laws that's being produced there, that they are not going to use it for the rest of the world. And I got told the other day by a young man, he said, Mary, I'm myself, that's a part of Occupy. He said, I'm sending you some more information. I said, oh. I said, what this time? He said, this governor and some other governors then got together and they have fought and got something through Washington. I'm not going to even tell you what it is. I'm going to let you go on and go to New York, come back and settle down. But they got something else for us. I said, oh my goodness. But you know, they're writing laws to protect these corporations, not to protect you and I. So you, you got the creativity. You can, you can battle this stuff back just like we had to battle it back. We're not going nowhere as long as we can help it. But at the same time, I don't have the energy. I don't have the future that you have. You got to fight for yourself and for, uh, and for the next generation. It's in your hands. You got the ability. You got more technology than we could imagine. And they're trying their best to, to corral that and, and uh, take that for their benefit. But every time they try to corral something, something else break out. And I say, go on with your bad self. You know, so, so it's up to you now as to what you can do. And we're not sitting back waiting on this or that leader to fly in to liberate you. You're the, you're the generals and you're what we've been waiting for. And you're gonna have to start using those brain cells to bring people more and more. You got to learn your history true enough. But you cannot uh, stay back there in history. And you got to understand the political and the economic situation that we are facing out here. And you have to understand a better world is possible. But is it a better world going to be possible by dropping out of the sky? Hell no. By the people that is at the helm right now? No. It's in your hand. And we can have a better future. I wish I could have lived long enough Oh my goodness, Dave, to have my own uh, electronic maid. <laughs> and you know, some people have electronic maid, electronic uh, babysitter, and electronic uh, this, that, and the other. And that could be on the market. We should be able to have leisure time, sit back and read, have somebody to massage me too, for everybody, you know? <laughs> But as long as the name of the game is profit, that's not going to happen. As long as the name is profit, and I'm going to tell you, water is gold today. Pure gold. And if we let them privatize our water, look, it hurts me when I'm on the airplane and I look down into the water and see the pollution down there. It, we have to take care of the environment, we have to take care of our future and everything. Again, it's in your hand. I'm through.
เริ่มแปลกใหญ่Let me tell you.、Um, I guess when she finished, I guess we'll be trying to snatch Christina. <laughs> and we always try to snatch people and bring them to Detroit. I say I can't, I can't give you a job, but I, I, I can give you. A, I can.、Uh, we can teach you a lot. <laughs> Maybe we can、uh, start up with some discussion questions. Anybody? Anything. You don't have to hold back, and you don't have to be so intellectual neither. <laughs> Projects of in, in urban agriculture that are going on, and I think that that's terribly exciting.、Um, and I wondered what the impact of the city manager is going to be on that movement. I mean, it seems like that effort that has come back to try to make things better. You know, maybe not in the same way as it was about the industrialization and the auto. But it, it was a way to get youth involved in urban agriculture and to do a lot of things. And I wonder if the city manager is going to have a stifling effect on that, and what your views are. City manager has an effect on everything. Now, when you talk about urban roots, you know, people in all the various communities,、uh, you know, have、uh, the young people have been out there trying to start the gardens and all that type of stuff, which is nice. Um, they got to、uh, a lot of the land they really have to deal with because you know they have been、uh, contaminated by the, the factories and what have you, and all a lot of that stuff is in our water.、Um, a lot of that property was given to the community by the city, but it's, you know they can come back and rezone that at any time that they want it. You know, and a lot of that, uh, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people in the community are now at the point that. You know, they depend on as far as their vegetables and stuff on that.、Uh, if they want, because see, they be a lot of young people do. As far as being a mayor, that that I'll tell you about him in a minute.、Uh, they be and and all the rest of them can to Martin. They said that how he said I'm going to really cooperate. With the emergency manager, because he thought he was going to be the emergency manager. Oh yes, he did. He went. There was a class that the governor held、uh, to train emergency managers. Dave Bean was、uh, jockeying for that position. Our ex mayor in Highland Park was jockeying for that position, because the whole thing is, I should, the city council stops me on a lot of things. What What do you think the duty of the city council is? So yeah, Dave Bean and all, all the rest of them had already said that he had sat down talking about redesigning the city, and see they talking about certain corporations being able to have certain areas and closing down certain neighborhoods and that type of stuff. So yeah, as far as that question, yes,、yeah, the city manager, the emergency manager, just like I said, a dictator will have the power over all that. They can take whatever they want. They took all our. We had camping grounds for Highland Park. We owned outside the city, and it was a tr- like a tree farm. They took that and sold it. They、uh, they sold a lot of things. The name of the game is talking about getting rid of the financial problem, and they used that. The, a- ask me. It's interesting. Uh, Ask me had sit down and figured out with their membership how could they help the city, and they went in with a budget of over the amount that they claimed they were in a deficit in. And Dave Bean and them say, okay, we'll look at this and stuff. They never got back on with them. They gave it to the governor.、Uh, Asme took it. You know, they took it to the governor, to the governor, and he looked at it and、uh, said no. But he then took their concept 
and start instituting some of it and try to act like it was his uh, idea and what happened. So, you know, they do what they want to. Uh, and this governor, he told you in the beginning, told us at the beginning, he, he was a business person. And he's doing exactly what, he's, what, what he was put in there to do. Because we, you, you're talking about some uh, corruption. They got some corruption. Because we ran one of our members for city council one time around the water affordability plan that we had wrote up for Detroit, which they stole to after a while, for Detroit and for Highland Park. And um, hmm. see that when you get old, you'll be seeing them on this. I, uh, I'll come back to it. Any of them a question? I'll have to come back to that. And the last time that you were here, you talked about uh, your break with the Winstonism. Oh, and I'm really curious about what that looked like, and in terms of like the transition, what that meant, like what that looked like in terms of maintaining the membership of an organization and trying to radically shift them towards a different politics, towards a different strategy, um, and what that could look like in the present, because Alinskyism has sort of shifted, and it may not be Alinskyism, but a lot of the tactics are similar. If now, you know, a lot of organizations aren't necessarily supported by their members the way they used to be through the Alinsky model, now they're supported through, you know, the left wing of capital. But what would it look like to take the organizations that are already present and to try to radically shift them? And do you think that's even possible? Now the politics that some of these organizations have now? I take the organization I'm in, and that's Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. When, when we had to change that organization from just organizing uh, AFDC recipients, people already on the roads, uh, we had to go through there and have them to shift. And how did we do that? We began to uh, show concretely that the situation that existed economically and, uh, and politically at the time that gave rise to uh, welfare right, I mean the National Welfare Rights Organization uh, and to Michigan WRO, which was a huge organization, is not existing no more. That more and more people were unemployed in Detroit uh, and throughout Michigan. And we needed to, and, and a lot of people was disabled. And uh, so the population, the poor pop, you know, population had increased. So we needed to also open up the doors that they become a part of our organization and that we cease being an organization of just AFDC recipients and general assistance recipients. And so we changed, not only did we change, we had built a, we built a national welfare rights union because the old organization had, doors had closed because of the government saying that we owed some back taxes. We didn't know those back taxes. That was the people that was prior to us that owed the back taxes, you know. But we changed the organization's name, and then we we built our organization on a different plat, you know, changed the existing organizations uh, to focus somewhere else, and that is uh, to solidify that solidarity that needed to exist among the unemployed, the low income section of the working class and to be a part of our organization. Um, and that in the final analysis, it, it went, who should be the people that should have the power to run the organization should, have been, should be the membership. And we only reflect what the membership wants. Uh, and so I like that better than any staff coming in and dictating to me what happened. Now, and a lot of, we do run up against a lot of those, and they don't last, those organizations that's so tied to these uh, uh, financial institutions, these agencies, uh, you know, funding agencies, and they're the ones that dictates to them what they can do and what they cannot do. At one time in welfare rights, we used to get a lot of funding from the archdiocese, you know, they would give it. 
And when they, I remember one time when we took a position pro-choice, they said that we had to drop that. I, I told some of the people that said that uh, if we drop that, we're going to start calling for retroactive abortion because people like you cannot run our organization. You know, we don't even have a choice. You know, being poor, you don't even have really a choice. But the question of being pro-choice is a question of a medical, a medical uh, term. You know, as far as uh, poor people, they should have a choice and it should be funded by the government. We should have universal health care. And now you don't even want us to have that. But if you're rich in this country, and you got a you and uh, what have you, you gonna have everything at your at your uh, need. So you know, some of the people didn't want us to change, but they stayed members, and uh, and it's been better for us because we had to shift our gears just as the objective situation changed. What welfare rights gave rise to welfare rights did not exist no more. We needed to expand it at the time. I don't know if I, uh, and, if, and then you went back to Alinsky, you know my feathers went up, <laughs> my hair went up. When I left, when we had problems with Saul Alinsky, I told you that Saul Alinsky came into Detroit and he met with the staff and he started telling us, criticizing the community about the rebellion that had taken place. I say, you don't live under the conditions we live up under. How you gonna come in here and dictate to us what the hell we should be doing? And so, you know, after that, I said, I'm sure it's glad we didn't raise that $64,000 to give to you because you, you're not worth it. But his tactics were good. I mean, his, his, his strategy as far as empowering the community to speak for themselves. But see, Alinsky wanted us, and I said, oh, he wanted us to have a piece of the pie. And I told him, I want the whole pie for the benefit of the community. Because, yeah, those corporations and all the rest of them have been robbing us for years. And we should be able to enjoy the fruits of our labor also. So, you know, uh, we learned from him and we let him go. Uh, he, his time had come to an end. And, but WCO lasted as long as, you know, the urban renewal and all that stuff. Uh, you know, certain conditions give rise to organization and certain conditions give ri uh, to rise to the fact that it disintegrates and die away. It's not needed no more. You need something else. You need to know how to shift your program to fit the conditions that's given rise to something else. So a lot of them died, you know, they died. We didn't lead, need the old League of Revolutionary no more. In fact, the League split. And um, once the League split, some of us decided to start doing some studying. People kept telling us about uh, the science and stuff. I said, what science are you talking about? And, and we went to, a, we, uh, all these workers and all of us went to a meeting one time and was in a room about this, I mean, it was so packed, you couldn't get into it. And they said they were gonna teach us the science of Marxism, Leninism. And some of us said, what is, I've heard that, but what is it? And we consistently, I mean, workers was getting off from work and everything. Uh, uh, and everybody, all of us was, going and we want to learn what was going to keep our organization going and, and for us to be able to uh, continue to uh, have a better life, right? And some people, some young folks told us, said, <laughs> some of you are going to learn Marxism and Leninism and some of you will not because it's not for you. And we said, well, what in the hell are we doing here trying to listen to you for? For three consecutive weeks we had gone. And once we put them out, we started teaching ourselves. You know, and some other folks that knew. And we stuck together. And we ended up with the majority of the organization in the old league. And since that time, uh, we've stuck with it. Letting it be a science, a guide. But uh, 
of the net, you know, this, all this stuff we're facing now, we, nobody has faced it before. Marx, Lenin, none of them have faced this before. But that don't negate the fact that we understand that we have, a, we have to have a vision. And that's what we, we, we need a vision to know that we don't have to live this way. We got the ability to produce enough food in California alone, one county in California alone. For, for the rest of the world. There, we got the ability to build houses in less than 45 minutes on the assembly line. And yet we got all these homeless people out here. Hospitals, I mean, here I am, a fine example of what hospitals can do. I didn't even know I was walking around with an aneurysm. And I went in the hospital because I have these little TIAs, you know, these little strokes. And the doctor came in there and said, Miss Kramer, how long have you had this aneurysm? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you've had an aneurysm for quite a while. I said, no, 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 wait a minute, doc. I just buried my sister two weeks ago. We did, my family did, because she had an aneurysm. He said, don't you know that they are hereditary? I said, I don't know anybody ever told me that. He said, yes, they are. And he gave me a lecture and a lesson as to how, he said, but your aneurysm, do not, we cannot cut your head to get to your aneurysm. You have to use the new technique. I said, oh Lord, here I go being a guinea pig again. He said, we can go up in there through your main artery and coil it. You know, in other words, packing that little aneurysm. He said, because we cannot cut in your head. And he was, he was a trooper. He said, this has been into, out on the, uh, they've been doing this since 1996. And he said, and here you go, just like the commercial on TV. If you take this medicine, this is the side effect. If you do this, this is the side effect. He said, the, the side effects could be, you know, we go up in there and some of that, uh, um, some, something might break off and it goes through your heart, you have a heart attack or something like that. Or, you know, a bigger stroke. Uh, this might happen, you know. I said, wait a minute, Doc. He said, but I advise you to take, young man, too, I advise you to take all this, your information, and send it to another doctor. Or uh, get on with a couple of other doctors to check you out. I said, oh, don't worry, I will. And I sent it to this female, black female uh, surgeon, um, what you call it, um, in uh, California, who was the same kind of surgeon he was. And she called me back after she looked at everything and she said, I concur. Not only do I concur, it's the only way they can deal with you. I said, well, thank you. And I went back and talked to him, he got me ready. And he was laughing with me. He said, you know, by the time I got you to the elevator, you were snoring. I said, yeah, I was either going to go out for good or I was going to walk out of here. I ended up in intensive care, you know, like they bring you out. And I'm laying up in there and I'm saying, oh my God, it's hurting. They didn't make me catch a cold. But you know, it ain't the cold, it's the stuff they put down in your throat. You know, and they took me to uh, say, well, Miss Kramer, we got to have you be here for the night uh, in intensive care and all that stuff. The next day, the doctor, up, the nurse got me up, and the other nurses come in there and say, what is she doing up and walking around? Because I had that, you know, they thought I, you know, after after this procedure, you couldn't do that. Then he said, okay, you're fine to go home. And they called transportation. Transportation said, what, what unit they gonna put on? They said, she's going home. No one could believe it. All I had to do was kind of relax for one week and then I was back on the road. But I got on our TV program and told people to go and get yourself examined for aneurysms because the, their medical um, 
You know, when you go and get a, uh, get a physical, they don't examine you for that. It's something else that have to give rise for, you to, for them to look into that. So, you know, you got all these, I, I say that to say, you got all these, uh, this equipment out here that could be taking care of people, preventive medicine and all that type of stuff. And they're not opening it up to people, only to certain folks. You know, I just haphazardly fell into that. But just think about a lot of people that have died. I thought about my sister. They could have, the aneurysm I had dissolved, was dissolved within a year. It was gone. That don't say I can get another one, but I could. But at least I know there are some other avenues I can take. Now, if they had to cut in my head, it would have taken me quite a while to, to have those brain cells, you know, to begin to uh, deal with the uh, reality and stuff again. But I was able to walk out of there and uh, because of the advance in technology. My husband was able to walk out of the hospital because he got a, what, a defibrillator and a, uh, what's the other one? Pacemaking is about that big inside of him. That's why he's living today and he has congested heart failure. But they don't, you know, that should be for all people out here to be able to have that type of stuff. So that's why I say technology is open. You know, you can talk to people. I, I was sitting in my bed one day and was in a conference. I had my pajamas on at the bottom. They didn't know it. Doing a, doing a, a conference call. And, you know, and they, I said, Darn, this is good. And I was trying to look at the basketball at the same time. But technology is something else. They don't need all of our hands no more to work. Under this society, but I know in another society, you know, that we could have uh, anything, and, you know, I don't care what you call it, uh, we could be able to uh, not only enjoy life, but even to produce for the next generation. I say, I won't be able to see it, but I can, I can dream it and I can visualize it and all that type of stuff, and I can work towards it. So organizations uh, come and go. Uh, but it's up to us to make sure that they're going towards the, the way that the objective situation say they have to move in. And that is, if you build an organization today to protect what you were saying, you're going to have to know that you're going to have to come up against that emergency management. And what are you going to do when you do come up against that emergency management? regardless of what type of society we have as well, that I think we need to talk about where do the metals come from that we use in the technology and the machinery and stuff. Who mines them? What conditions do they mine them under? Who's, uh, where does the oil come from that we use? What are the conditions of the labor of the people producing? All this stuff that I'm sure you know, that it's not quite as magical, <laughs> you know, or as simple as that, even under socialism or under whatever society we can imagine. Um, these questions still exist. And so then how do we, so I guess my question would be, how do we go about constructing the type of society that we want to see while taking into consideration all those things that might not allow us to uh, build the, or utilize the type of technology that we might want in our fantasies? Yeah. In my vision of that stuff, the scientists, as well as yourself, will have the opportunity to be able to uh, make sure that when we go after that, uh, all the stuff that you had talked about, that is not going to uh, hurt uh, the environment. Yes, it could be done. Because if you look at it now, who does the army serve? And if the army was turned around to serve the benefit of the people, a lot of the things that they're doing, they wouldn't be doing. Because at, at, when I look at, when I, when I travel, when I travel around, you know, in different countries, it's a, my thing be, why people are not, some of them are not enjoying some of the things that we might even have here? Because, that, because they got this border up 
to protect the profit for certain capitalists not to flow unless they say it flowed back and forth. You know, so they pit us against one another for their benefits. So, you know, uh, if we could feed the world because of what we produce and help them also to produce and stuff, you, you, would, you would have a better world. And right now they're using food to keep all of us un, under attack for their benefit. See, I, I think all that could be taken care of. They had to build this society, right? Am I right? Yeah, somewhat. We, we built this society, but they put the laws on top of it to keep their private property, take care of their private property. And I'm not talking about our little houses or that type of stuff. For them to have the ability to make sure that they make their, uh, their profits and stuff. So I think that's, that's something that could be taken care of. If I, if I have ever lived, if I have the opportunity to live that long, uh, the first thing I would want to do is get a plan. And getting a plan to encompass everything that you have said in order for all of us to benefit from it, right? Okay. So you and I can run the government. I, I don't... Picking up on one thing you said, I think it was about the 60s male supremacy in your in your organization, mm -hmm. and given it's quite a moment right now for revolutionary or socialist organizations, like in the UK at the moment, there's uh, the, you know a, a member of the Central Committee um, raped someone, and the way that they handled it is now meant that there's been a complete transformation of of that organization or um, and we you know I was just wondering what this what the state of women's struggle in in Detroit is at the moment and whether whether you would still say that male supremacy is a thing to contend with in your organizing a lot of the, a lot of the uh, people that was in our organization that stayed, uh, men uh, began to understand that uh, when you talk about collectivity, uh, you're talking about the woman being in, in leadership role also. And, and some of that nonsense that they were dealing, some of that nonsense that they were raised with uh, had to be fought against. The capitalist supports that type of stuff to keep us divided. Uh, a woman is harassed every 18 seconds, either killed or what have you, in this country. And, and so, and this country uh, let them get away with that stuff. Men are victims as well as we are. But it is, we are the big victims, you know, as far as that male supremacy goes. And so we're constantly fighting. Right now, last year we held uh, coming out of the U.S. social plan, we built uh, the assembly to end poverty. And it was interesting that today when I turned on the TV and started looking at the legislature uh, uh, in uh, Washington, Barbara Lee out of California was speaking. And she said that one of the amendments that she had introduced uh, around this Paul Ryan's uh, budget 
was that the United States should uh, be fighting to get rid of poverty in, in, in 10 years. And she said, because this bill helped create poverty that they're talking about uh, passing. It's the same thing with the whole, you know, you know, you got certain laws out here talking about fighting against male supremacy, but the United States do not effectively um, implement it. Yes, male supremacy is, is there, just like, uh, uh, you know, in the 60s, but women tends to be... I, I've seen a lot of women much more stronger than what they have been in, during that period of time. So what is happening? We got a new generation. We came out of the U.S. So, social forum with uh, the Assembly to End Poverty, and one of our things was that we were going to support and help build the World Court of Women. So last year we had a regional World Court of Women court in, uh, on the West Coast, and it was, oh, it was great. Young women that have never been involved, and all the women, and nothing came forth. Some of them had been in prison, some of them had been homeless, some of them had, um, they talked about their job setting, their, their, uh, you name it. And then, too, you had all these different cultures that came together. It was so beautiful. So, and they, they came out, and you could, you could see some of the stuff that they passed. If you look on the WEEP, Women Economic uh, Agenda Project, that was the first World Court of Women that we held. The second one will be in the Midwest uh, in September. We will be, and each region is different. And it will be a World Court of Women uh, to begin to move against some of these inequities, and not only that, the whole, the whole economic situation that we're facing, political situation that we're facing now. These are folks that never, a lot of them last year was folks that never been involved in nothing in their lives. They came in, the new woman movement, not the woman movement to get rid of the bras and all that stuff that happened. And, you know, this is new. Different type of woman's movement that existed at, at this time. Because um, women, uh, just recently in Michigan, one of the things that was passed was to implement, I mean, they, they began to implement the time limitation on public assistance. So March 1st, they, they knocked off 90,000 people. Not 9,000 9, people. 9,000 families gone. Uh, they said they had reached a time limit. They didn't care if they had jobs or nothing. The first thing they face is homelessness. And these mothers, and I've met a lot of them have come in our office, the ones that got knocked off before. They were the ones hiding in some of these abandoned homes to be able to protect their children and what have you. And so we started a movement that housing is a human right. And some of the first people we came up against was the land bankers who in, exist in these cities. They get federal funds to, to buy these homes, federal funds to fix up the home, and then they sell them. But they don't want poor people in their community. And these young women have stayed with us as far as the organ and emerging as, as, as leaders in that movement. So they will be some of the leading forces at, at, around this world court of women in uh, the West, um, uh, in the Midwest this, in September. There's one plan for uh, Philadelphia for the East Coast in October. Uh, PPERT, People Economic Human Rights Coalition, is heading that up, you know, to set up the region to make sure that that happened. And then there's one plan being planned for the South, and then a national one will be planned. But uh, it's the or get women, uh, begin to get women in, uh, to moving forward again. Because, uh, again, I say the situation is not the same when the first women movement started. And, and uh, the, uh, one mother got up at that, at that World Court of Women, and she just cried. She said, I didn't know my son was involved in all this type of organizing. All she remembered, her son, she had lost him to the drug trade. She's so proud of him, and she worked for legal services. She got up, she said, all this stuff I've heard today, I want to know who in here want to help me tomorrow to go take a house with some of these families. I was, and she's still involved. 
and this was back in Ju July. And she, uh, so, you know, it's people that are joining and um, women have to understand that they have to take their rightful place and be leaders out here. And not, you know, I've had young women come in my office from spouse abuse, from abuse by the system and everything else. And they have emerged as some hell of a leaders. So, yeah, we still fighting male supremacy. I mean, male supremacy is a tool of the capitalist class. So we have to, we have to constantly fight that. We fighting that, we fighting racism and all that stuff. It's, you know, it's a constant occurrence to keep us all divided. And one thing that this, this, uh, this, what is happening around here, a new type of leadership is coming about that is being built by this capitalist and stuff like that. And, and this, uh, you know, they always want to give us the leaders. They, they talk about we got to maintain the middle class. Hmm, they're in the middle class out here. Holly, you know, it might be an upper part cross of the, of the working class, but my, I, the definition I learned as a middle class is, is people that uh, work their families, have their own, you know, and, and have some little petty business and that type of stuff. All that, I know that don't happen too much in my neighborhood no more. So, it's, you know, they constantly run that crap in Michigan, and people keep saying, what is a middle class? Uh, they want to know what is right. They're beginning to learn because they're getting slapped with it. What is right to work means. Uh, they're, they're slowly beginning to wake up to understand that there's some things that are confronting us that we have to take care of. And it's not going to be taken care of unless they get, get involved. Just talking about that for one more. I thought you was going to say Me? Yeah. No. I mean, I will. If I want. <laughs> Anybody else? I was, I was going to ask you a little bit about, given the changes occurring, what do you think the future role of the labor movement, the union movement, is going to be? I mean, it's so different now than it was in the 1960s. Much different. Yeah. I just attended the um, Black Men in Union conference that happens every year in, in Michigan. And it's under the University of Michigan. They tried to get rid of it. And the people fought back and got it because they would utilize, some of the workers started, they would utilize the funds that they had negotiated for education, each worker's had to serve a little pot of money for education, they would utilize that to go to black men and women. And then they had, excuse me, they had the women's, um, and women in, movement, in, in the union, Spanish in the union, and now they're doing the youth, young people in the union. So once we got it back, one of the things one of the classes I had to help teach, because we have in, is uh, unionism and human rights. All these young people that come to these, even older people, that's a, you know, you have to go through your union and everything to come to these classes. The, uh, they sit up in those classes and they learn stuff that they don't even learn in the unions. After about the African American struggle uh, in, in the union. Uh, they learn a lot of stuff they should have been taught in the union uh, as far as, uh, you know, how to represent people, all that type of stuff. What is the, about the relationship between men and women? But what ends up happening, they start learning stuff that they did not, le that they don't learn when they, you know, out there on the job and that type, and they learn at, at black men in union, and they sit up there and they, and they begin to cry. Men, they be hurt because they have not been taught this type of stuff, and they might have been in there for years and they have been taught it. And when they came to our class, they began to understand what uh, right to work meant. And why haven't we been taught about right to work in the past? 
Why are they able to pass right to work now? And we told them because y'all are so disorganized and nobody had taught you about, have taught you about right to work and what uh, this uh, emergency manager is all about. They didn't know nothing about, you know, how that affect them even where they work and what happened. So the union movement, if you got two things going on. You got, um, we taught them that they had to be able to not only teach their union members about right to work and begin to tactically, you know, strategically and tactically move to move out, but they got to go in their communities and begin to teach people about right to work and what role the unions have played historically, uh, you know, in this country. Uh, in order for, we, for this not to be able to spread to other, you know, other cities and what have you. They are, you know, if this right to work keep getting hold, the unions don't die. Right now it's like starting all over again in what we're doing. Because the teachers, when you come to the teachers union and what have you, uh, they don't need a union. They're not using unions in charter schools. There's only one charter school in the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan that have unionized. Only one. Uh, they, you know, they don't have the uh, power on, on at, at, at these plant sites to unionize, you know, uh, it, within right to work. They cannot go in there and tell them about getting this sign and that sign for folks to become a part of the union. The union has to become an organization of the community and involve the community, involve the churches and everything else, just like Canada does. And in order to fight back this stuff, they have to stop being thinking that they need to sit at the table and be a part of these darn um, board of directors. They got to represent the interests of the workers. And Darren's sitting up there with Henry Ford. I can't stand it, and I say it right here. <laughs> Every holiday, when they have a, a, a party for the retirees, or uh, the whole of the Region 1A, uh, no, I mean the whole of Local 600, which is uh, one of the law Ford workers. And we go out there, we look up, here come Henry Ford. Not Henry Ford, uh, uh, the young Ford. Walking through there like he's your buddy and all that type of stuff. And I said, I, Jen, don't let him come over here. Please don't let him come over because I know I'm not going to act right. Uh, I don't want him to even touch me. I just man making profits after profits after profits off our backs. And here they talking about, they didn't move the insurance, our health care insurance that the union got to run it. And, that, and what's happening is we can't even afford our own health care holly no more because of the co-payment you got to pay for, for the medicine and what have you. Your little social security check go for all that. And the union used to take a stand on all that type of stuff. Not no more. So if we're going to have a union, it's going to be, have to be under some new leadership and some new type of politics. But otherwise, the union is dying, uh, dying away in a lot of places. And they are not moving to organize in a certain place. The way they, they should be out in the community every day knocking on doors, teaching people what right to work is all about. So yeah, they got a hard, rough, rough time right now. And they need to get the hell out of uh, supporting that Democratic Party all the time, too. Pull our money out of there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, Y'all don't know if the union pull out the money in Detroit and places from supporting the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party probably will die. Right? Yeah. They'll die there, I know. But great, thank you great, for having me. Well, thank you. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. Right. Okay. At ten o'clock.